Welcome. I'm Heather Swanson. I'm the nurse practitioner with the Valente team at the Arthritis Center. How many of you guys are already um, involved in the Arthritis Center in some way? Family, friends, or souls? Yeah, it's, it's the majority of the cause. Okay, so tonight we're talking about vitamin D. Vitamin D is a little bit of a rage right now, and I'm in favor of the rage myself. But it's kind of like coffee in healthcare, you know. One time coffee's a bad thing, the next time coffee's a good thing, you know. So maybe that's what we'll end up with, but I really don't think so. Because vitamin D actually has special activity inside of us. So. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, so what is vitamin D? Well, it's affectionately called the sunshine vitamin because sun is the number one source of vitamin D for us. It's a fat-soluble vitamin that our body makes when it's exposed to sunlight. There are many things that vitamin D does in our body, but the, the key ones are here. It helps our body absorb calcium from our diet which helps us to form strong bones. That's really its principal function from our side of the road in rheumatology. It also prevents abnormally low blood calcium that can lead to intermittent muscle spasm called tetany. It also suppresses the release of the parathyroid hormone, and that hormone, when it's active and overactive, causes our, our bone to be reabsorbed. We don't want that. We want to keep our bone in our bone. So, as I said, sunshine is our largest single source of vitamin D. And also, as I, I'm ahead of myself, I guess. So, we have chemical compounds in the skin's superficial layers that convert to vitamin D3 with exposure to sunlight. And the amount we need for synthesis depends on several things. Our age, our, the shade of our skin, and then underlying medical conditions. <clears throat> And just as we all know, too much sun is not a good thing either. So sunburn and then risk of skin cancer. So we have to balance this. We have to find that fine line of how do we get enough vitamin D through our sun sources and not get sunburns. So a fair-skinned person who's outdoors in a bathing suit long enough to get a slight redness, that's equivalent to 10 to 25,000 international units of taking vitamin D by mouth. We don't really want to produce a light redness, so we need to be out in the sun less than that. And then when we're darker, we need about twice the amount of skin. This sun, not skin. I only have so much skin. Well, I thought this one was kind of funny, so I put it. So, so sunscreen, its whole job is to block the UVB rays. That's the sunlight. And even just a little bit, uh, SPF 8 blocks 95% of the sun. So if you're outside and you go outside with your sunscreen all the way on, you're really blocking most of it. So you really aren't using that sun exposure at all for your vitamin D synthesis. So again, you have to balance overexposure, like that young man, versus underexposure. Okay. So uh, many of the places will tell you, wait 10 to 15 minutes and then put your sunscreen on. So you get a nice kiss of sun without getting the sun. There are exceptions, of course. There are people who are sun sensitive. There are people who, are just, people who just really shouldn't be out at 10 to 15 minutes. There are other ways to get vitamin D, and that is through your diet, but it's not anywhere as good as getting it from the sun, but it's what we have, okay? We have fortified cow's milk, and actually the most of the alternative milks are also fortifying with vitamin D, but you read your labels to be sure, okay? An eight ounce glass of milk only has 100 international units of vitamin D, and when we get further into the slides and you see how much you need in a day of like, milk, I mean, that's good and it tastes good, but it's not a lot of vitamin D. Orange juices are fortified. They're fortifying them with calcium too. Calcium and vitamin D are partners. Yogurts, some cheeses, some canned tuna fish, and then of course our breakfast cereals are fortified also. But it's not a lot, it's not 100%. But it's some, and when you add them together for your regular balanced diet, you can get a decent amount. But ultimately, can you get enough? 
just from dietary sources? No. Oily fish, wild cut ones, not the ones that have been just swimming around in a circle in somebody's tank. I mean, because they do do some fish like that. Um, cooked salmon or mackerel and sun dried mushrooms. They are pretty good. And then cod liver has a bunch of vitamin D, but we don't recommend that as a single source because it has a lot of vitamin A. And when you get too much vitamin A, then you have some toxicity issues too. So what happens when you don't have enough vitamin D? Well, most of you older adults in here will remember rickets because rickets were around for a long time before we started adding vitamin D to milk in the 1930s. When you don't have enough vitamin D, then you can't have, you don't have enough of your building blocks. Calcium and vitamin D are building blocks of good, strong bone. When you don't have enough, you have soft bones. And when your bones are soft and you're developing, you end up with the severely bowed legs and deformities. In the adult, which can also happen after you've formed good bone, as an adult, if you're deficient in calcium and vitamin D, you have a condition called osteomalacia, which is also soft weak bones. You can have bone pain, you can have muscle weakness as well. And then, of course, the thing that we speak about a lot in rheumatology is osteoporosis. Um, individuals with osteoporosis often have vitamin D deficiency. We have under intake of calcium, and that's why our, that's part of the component of the osteoporosis is we don't have those good building blocks. Okay? And then with osteoporosis, especially those of you who were with me last year when I talked about osteoporosis, we know that there are fractures that can be involved with osteoporosis. And the keys, the key fractures in osteoporosis are typically hip, wrist, and vertebral. Okay, there are certain individuals who are at more risk for vitamin D deficiency than others. When you have inadequate dietary intake, when you have limited sun exposure, over age 50, because your storage declines as you age, dark skin as we talked about, people who are overweight, obese, or have had gastric bypass surgery, People with milk allergy or lact and lactose intolerance because they're not getting their dietary intake. <coughs> and then exclusively breastfed babies because human milk only has low levels of vitamin D. And unless they're supplementing their kiddos with the vitamin D, they're probably quite <coughs> deficient. However, I'm sure that there are other people that would argue that fact, and I won't I won't talk much about <coughs> children or babies because I'm primarily in the Additional risk factors. Intestinal malabsorption. People have Crohn's disease, people who have celiac, who don't absorb well in their gut. Folks with cystic fibrosis because they have poor fat absorption. Remember that vitamin D is a fat sign. People with kidney disease because they produce less vitamin D and they have increased loss of vitamin D because of the kidney disease itself. Liver disease because they can't produce it and then people with extensive burn injuries. And I would really have to look into that one more to further understand it, but I suspect it's because we have, it's a very much a, a malabsorption problem because our skin, the skin is destroyed by the burn. Um, a genetic mutation causing vitamin D resistance. And then people with lupus or cutaneous lupus because there is a sun sensitivity factor with lupus and it aggravates the lupus itself. And in cutaneous lupus, the sun can actually cause the lesions. So they are not outside. So they have a higher tendency towards vitamin D deficiency. Okay, so how do we know if we're deficient? Well, there's a simple test. It's a 25 OH vitamin D test. This can happen at your primary care provider, at your women's health care provider, at your rheumatologist. It's a simple test. And I believe even if you're Insurance doesn't pay for it. I think at our facility, it's a pretty low cost test. You know, if you've already had your blood drawn, we can be an easy add-on, and even if your insurance will pay for it, it's relatively inexpensive, less than $30 kind of expensive. Okay, so who should definitely be tested? People who are homebound or in long-term care facilities. Okay, so this is your individual who is in long-term care, whether that's um, a nursing home situation or this is somebody 
who is um, such as out at BSDC if they're not out in the sun very much. You know, kiddos out at um, Beatrice. Um, prisoners get outside, you know, at least once a day, so I don't think they're probably vitamin deficient. Okay. Um, the risk factor groups from the previous two slides, those should be tested. Any mom with osteoporosis, osteopenia, or a past history of low trauma fracture, which low trauma fracture actually is what puts you into the osteoporosis category, we included that as a own piece. And anyone who, when getting other blood tests drawn, is found to have a low blood calcium phosphate. Vitamin D is not included in a routine laboratory study that you get on an annual exam, typically, unless it's specifically added. But calcium is a regular chemistry of particle test. Okay, so how do we decide who is deficient? Normal levels are 30 or more nanograms per milliliter. Okay, so we're just going to go with 30. We're not going to talk in nanograms. Insufficiency is when you're 20 to 30, and then deficiency is less than 20. In practice, I just use the word deficiency. I think if you're under 30, you're just deficient. But those are the formal. All right, so in order to maintain an adequate vitamin D level, 30 or better, how do we do that? Your body functionally needs about 4,000 international units. International units is the measurement of size. Just like other things are milligrams, vitamin D is done in international units. Okay? We, many of us get about 2,000 between a little bit of sun exposures that we have and the fortified foods that we eat. So we get about 2,000, so 4,000, minus 2,000, that still leaves us with about 2,000 that maybe we need to supplement with. The Institute of Medicine and the National Osteoporosis Foundation recommend that men and women under 50 get about 400 to 800 additional international units each day beyond you know, the sun exposure and the work that we And then when you're over 50, 800 to 1,000. But is that enough for you? Here is the part where I recommend that you just ask your healthcare provider to test your vitamin D sometime during the year. I would recommend doing it at the trough point in our year, and I call that trough meaning the worst, darkest, grayest part of the year when we're having the least sun exposure. So January's a good year in Nebraska. Because generally, most of us do have fair sun exposure during the summer, those of us that are reasonably active. So we will tend to be more adequate during the summer months with the sun, but January in Nebraska. Okay. So we know, like, as I said on the other slides, people who spend most of their time inside are probably short on sun. People who live in northern latitudes, and I thought this was very interesting. In Boston, Massachusetts, and Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, your skin virtually ceases to produce vitamin D between October and April. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of vitamin D deficiency in the Northeast. And then people will put this down. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of different forms of vitamin D. They're not all the same. Cholecosiferol, that um, it's not active in its own self. It has to be converted, but it is a dietary supplement and it's available and over the counter. But most of the vitamin D you will find Walmart Super Saver. Greens, etc. It's going to be ergo calciferol, and that also requires the conversion, but your body can do that. And then it's available both orally and by prescription, oral amounts, and then by them. Calcitriol, you can, unless you have kidney disease, you can just just gloss over this one because it's really only used in the, in the kidney situation and the parathyroid situation. So that one is given just by prescription. couple different bottles there for you. But I do want you to read your labels because we'll talk about the dosages here pretty soon. There is a lot out there. There is a lot out there on your on your pharmacy shelf. There are vitamin D supplements at chiropractors. There are vitamin D supplements at dermatologists. I mean, you would really need to be careful and read those labels because the dosages are, di dosages are different. And that's because it's not a prescription product. Okay, so there's daily dosing, there's weekly dosing, there's weekly dosing. 
system depends on how much you need and how it's delivered. If your vitamin D is low on the blood test, your healthcare provider who has done the test for you should be giving you recommendations on how much is right for you to bring your level to 30 or more. If you decide to supplement yourself without having the blood test first, please don't use more than 1,000 or 2,000 before then getting your vitamin D checked because vitamin D helps your body manage the calcium, remember? So if we're getting too much vitamin D, then we're getting too much calcium, and that can cause our medical arteries, and we don't want that to happen. Kidney stones is another thing that can happen if we have too much calcium. So I feel safe telling you, if you're just doing one or 2,000 on your own, that's fine, that's good, but sometime during the year, go ahead and have your test done. So people with normal vitamin D levels, again, the IOM and the National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends age 50 and younger take about 400 to 800 and over 50, 800 to 1,000. Again, about labels. Multivitamins typically have vitamin D in them also. So keep that in mind. Because you may be getting 1,000 of vitamin D in your daily multivitamin. My target brand multivitamin has a thousand in it. Okay? If your level is less than 20, this is very low. This is the full deficiency. In our practice, we typically prescribe 50,000 international use of vitamin D2 twice a week for eight weeks. Then we go home once a week and we recheck that for three months. But that's a prescription situation. With vitamin D2, D2, I thought they recommended vitamin D3. D3 is what you can get over the counter. Oh, D2 is prescription? Okay. Thank you. And then if your level is in the mid zone of 20 to 30, typically you can achieve normal levels with 1,000 or 2,000. Our rule of thumb is that 1,000 of vitamin D can generally boost you about eight points. So if you're 20 and you start taking 1,000 of vitamin D3, probably get to 28. Okay, so that's kind of our rule of thumb. And then of course we check in three months to make sure that your level is adequate. Okay, so is it possible to take too much? Yes, just as I was referring to, if you have too much vitamin D, you can absorb too much calcium, which can cause the blood level of calcium to rise, which can lead to the atherosclerosis, the you know, arteries, the kidney stones. You just don't want the damage to happen, so that's the thing for that. Um, the Institute of Medicine, they set their very highest upper limit of supplement at 4,000 daily. But again, if your level is 15, you need your healthcare provider to be prescribing your replacement. So it's actually going to be more than this. You can't get too much from the sun. You can get a sunburn, but not too much vitamin D. Okay, so that's always a decent source as long as you're being careful with your sun's marks. Um, generally, there's not much in the <coughs> side effects unless you're getting your vitamin D levels way high. Okay, and so instead of being just above 30, if you're getting greater than 100 at your level, then again, you have the high calcium in your blood and you have the kidney stone. So follow your dosing instructions closely as your healthcare provider institutes for you, and avoid taking the multiple products without talking to your provider. And by multiple products, I mean taking your multivitamin vitamin D plus your extra vitamin D plus maybe you're um, taking another supplement from one of those other health food companies that has more. I mean, really do the math. There is some potential interaction with other medications. Um, laxative steroids and anti-seizure medicines, some of them cause your body to absorb less vitamin D. Um, the joxin, because you don't want to be messing with your rhythm, high calcium can also cause rhythm abnormalities in your heart rhythm. So if you're on the joxin, you want to avoid having excessive vitamin D to avoid the excessive calcium. And then of course, talk to us. Talk to us. Talk to your pharmacist. Okay. Here's kind of the exciting part, and this is where we get to that whole coffee comparison. You know, what's on the horizon?
because they're looking at lots and lots of different things in terms of vitamin D. But before I move into this section, are there any other questions? Is there a better time to take it? Not necessarily. No, morning versus evening. And if, if you don't have to worry about taking it with food or avoiding certain foods when you swallow it, can you if you're taking, say, 2,000, do you ever take one in the morning and one at night? No, nope, you can take them together. Mm -hmm. But that's a good question because um, you probably have heard me say that <coughs> calcium, your body can only absorb about five or 600 at a time, so we coach you not to take all your calcium together because you're wasting it, because your body just push it through and not absorb it. So we always do calcium as separate doses, but the vitamin D can go together. Yes? Are you going to talk more about the the two types of uh, calcium, the two forms of calcium? I, I, I wasn't planning to. Mostly you're just going to look for vitamin D3. Okay. So okay. Is vitamin D3 the same no matter what brand it is? It's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> but again, vitamins aren't regulated directly by the FDA, so you just have to, you know, trust, trust the certain vitamins that you know historically have, have been okay. Know, and that's why I say I shy away from you know things you just pick up for free off somebody's counter. I don't encourage that. You know, Nature Me does a good job. Vitamins Target does a good job. Walgreens does a good job. I mean, you know, just just be careful. Okay. So some of the exciting stuff that's out there: vitamin D and asthma. Okay, people with asthma might have an increased risk of vitamin D deficiency. Okay, so they could potentially have a reduction in inflammation, their asthma severity, and improving treatment with vitamin D repletion or replacement. But just like I'll say in different words on each slide, more research needs to be done. This is this is too new. There's not enough definitive information out there. But it's on the horizon. Um, autoimmune diseases, you know, that's our thing in rheumatology. Vitamin D receptors are present on all nucleated cells, including the cells of the immune system. That's exciting news, okay? So they are speculating that vitamin D could modulate, you know, or make differences in our immune function and potentially influence the risk of or the course of autoimmune disease. That's very exciting in our world, but this is very much not a um, concrete piece of information yet. But this is research that's underway. Um, what that would mean would be, would be that vitamin D could, again, reduce inflammation and help reduce symptoms in all the diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis is ours, but we have a lot of patients with Crohn's because they interlap um, with our other inflammatory arthritis family. And again, we need more research. So it's exciting. There's the potential. Vitamin D and cancer. Now, this one's been studied a lot. Prostate, breast, and colon cancer. They know there is substantial evidence that shows the importance of vitamin D to help prevent those cancers. This is probably one of the most studied ones so far. Um, they also have figured out that it may boost your risk for pancreatic cancer, however. But again, there's not a dose piece there. They haven't said, if you take this much, this is raising your risk for pancreatic cancer. Those studies are just too So we need to do more. So for now, just like any other cancer risk prevention strategy, keep a healthy body weight, exercise regularly, and use the death guidelines that the American Cancer Society sets out. Those are the things we know for sure, because those are probably true. But there's, there's the potential that vitamin D may be a player here. Um, vitamin D and cardiovascular disease is really how I was just saying about hardening of their arteries, the abnormal rhythms, Okay. Low vitamin D, though, has been linked to greater risk of heart attack, stroke, and heart disease, which is very interesting. Blood pressure um, is often higher during the winter, at a further distance from the equator, and in people with darker skin pigmentation. So, okay, during the winter, your vitamin Ds are lower. When you're further from the equator, your vitamin D tends to be lower. When your skin is darker, you have the lower vitamin D. So, those people have higher blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Interesting finding. So again, we need more studies. And then there's the same case that I've been seeing several times about too high vitamin D. Vitamin D and dementia, vitamin D and Alzheimer's. Okay, 
older people are more likely to have vitamin D levels that are low. Now, how do we know? Why are they low? Are they low because they're not going outside? Are they low because they're not eating properly? Or are they low because they're older and we don't have as good of stores of vitamin D like we said on the first couple of slides? So older people with vitamin D deficiency performed poorly on tests of memory, attention, and reasoning compared to people with adequate vitamin D levels. That's pretty interesting also. Weekly dietary intake of vitamin D has been linked to better mental performance in older women. Interesting. I think this is good information because vitamin D taken in a reasonable amount could really make a big difference for you potentially. But we don't know because we need more studies. Okay. Why weekly? Uh, why weekly? That was just that form of that study. That's oh, just okay. how they did it. They may so have it could been, be daily or <laughs> they may have been using a fifty thousand oh, national okay. unit quantity. Okay, so vitamin D and depression. And I will expand that informally to mood, generally. Okay. It plays a role in brain development and function. And they found that patients with depression have low levels of vitamin D. But again, this is an interesting question because just as in the older adults with, with dementia, are they they're depressed so they're not going outside and getting vitamin D? They're depressed so are they not eating well? Or are they low vitamin D because of a different thing? Studies don't show that vitamin D supplementation reduces the symptoms of depression. It does not show that thus far. And it's a serious disease, so if depression's an issue, you need to talk to your healthcare provider. But that would be another um, good reason to maybe have your vitamin D check if you had some mood disorder. Um, seasonal affective disorder, that's the, the mood issue that primarily happens during the winter months when we have less sunshine. So, in one study, vitamin D was found to be better than light therapy, because light therapy is often used for the treatment of, of SAD, a little UVB box right on your counter as you eat your breakfast. Vitamin D may have been better than the light therapy, so that's interesting. Dental caries, there's some evidence that it's helped preventing dental cavities. Again, pretty new research. That's a really one of the newer ones. Um, diabetes. Some studies show a link between vitamin D, low vitamin D, and type 1 and type 2 diabetes. But there's not enough proof yet for health providers to recommend taking a supplement to prevent diabetes. There's not enough information yet. And excess body fat plays a role with type 2 diabetes and low levels of vitamin D because of these fat absorption. Okay, falls. This is an interesting piece, and there's a lot right now in our rheumatology literature about postmenopausal women and falls. But they really, um, a couple of the studies conflict each other. Some of them say there are fewer falls in the postmenopausal women who have normal vitamin D, and there are studies that say there's no difference. So, again, we need more studies. Fibro, nothing consistent. So, no use for vitamin D at this point. But I will say that um, often there are mood issues in fibromyalgia, so we just want to alert to check your vitamin D level. Um, immune confidence. This is really pretty fascinating. So early research, 1980s, suggested that vitamin D and similar compounds could impact immune function. Okay, so that's interesting. Vitamin D enhances, this is kind of a big sentence, I realize that, um, bactericidal media and fives germs by inducing antimicrobial peptide. I'm not gonna even know what this, but I think it's cathelicidin, which has broad spectrum or big efforts, activities against a lot of different pathogens, and that's um, viral, bacterial, and fungal pathogens. So that's super exciting, I think. A lot of their work was done with TB, tuberculosis, flu, and upper respiratory tract infections. So here again are more questions. Does the vitamin D deficiency increase the risk for infection? And does replacing the vitamin D improve our offense as the host? We need more studies. But this one is, this one there's a lot of work on, a lot of active research because it's very exciting because 
could we use vitamin D to help treat? Are we just using vitamin D to make our host better so that they mount a better offense? We have to figure that out. Lots of work for these researchers. Okay, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus. Everybody's heard of MRSA at this point, unfortunately. There was a study that was done at a VA with um, patients with vitamin D greater than 20. So it wasn't super deficient, but it was still deficient. The incidence of MRSA infections was double. Double those that had adequate vitamin D versus inadequate. That says something about the slide we just saw about immune function. And so my question there is, is vitamin D deficiency representing a modifiable factor for reducing our susceptibility to infection or just indicating that our health is bad? You know, maybe we're getting MRSA because we're not exercising, we're not out of the sun, we're not eating well, so our whole general health is just not as good and that included a little bit of our vitamin D level and that's what we get susceptible to MRSA. Any more studies? Um, multiple sclerosis in vitamin D is also exciting. This one's pretty well established also, along with the colon, breast, and prostate cancer. <clears throat> multiple sclerosis is more common in people who live further from the equator, so we have less sunlight. Okay? And the scientist has suspected a link between sunlight, vitamin D, and MS, which is an autoimmune disease that damages our nerves. Okay? So one study found an association between a defect that caused us to have low vitamin D and higher risk of multiple sclerosis, which is really fascinating. But still, there's not enough evidence yet for healthcare providers to say, yes, we need to have vitamin D repletion for MS prevention. There's not enough evidence to say that not right. But there's a definitive link. Um, vitamin D with muscle pain and weakness. It's been linked, but there's really no strong evidence. It's lacking, so I wouldn't count on vitamin D taking away your muscle pain and weakness. Osteoarthritis, inconclusive. So it's not a fix it for regular wear and tear arthritis. Um, this one, I wasn't sure where to put this slide in, in this presentation because it's really not um, a research thing. It's a, something that they already use, and I thought it was interesting but since it goes with other diseases. So there is a, one of the prescription creams that they use in psoriasis is a man-made compound that's similar to vitamin D. Kind of interesting, and you know that psoriasis people use light therapy for their skin. And then this other vitamin D ointment, um, this is another set that is also safe and low-tolerant, and that's similar to the Dopamax, or you know, they're from the same vitamin D sort of family. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, stroke outcomes, this is a newer study that I read. Um, the researchers there found that as your vitamin D decreased, there is an increase in the size of your stroke. And then people with normal vitamin D had smaller size of stroke. And the people with vitamin D under 20 had poor, worst 90-day outcomes. So this is an interesting piece, and this, again, is a newer set of studies. Weight loss. Some people who are obese have low levels of vitamin D, okay? The body fat traps the vitamin D, making it less available to the body. Okay, so that makes sense if you're obese, why your vitamin D might be low. And we don't know for sure if the obesity causes the low vitamin D or the vitamin D deficiency induces the obesity. Okay. A small study of people who are dieting suggested that adding the vitamin D to the calorie restricted diet helped overweight people with low vitamin D levels to lose weight more easily. However, that's probably a fairly loose sort of concept, and there was probably lots and lots of variables. So unless it was a super controlled study, I wouldn't take that as viable to report. Okay, so ultimately, here's the thing. We live in Nebraska, we have long winters. Have your vitamin D checked and supplement it based on what the recommendations are. 
provider for them. That's the health, the primary care, what the autonomy is. Well, you're always synthesizing vitamin D, so you should never have a complete depletion. I've seen levels in my clinic, I think my lowest one I saw was eight, and that was just two weeks ago. So I, I'm treating her with a 50,000 international units of vitamin D twice a week for eight weeks, and you're going to follow that with once a week, and you're going to recheck her level in three months. And I'm really interested to see if it maybe helps a few things in her, and it would just be theoretical, it would just be. I'm interested to see if it changes her pain perceptions. I'm interested to see if it changes her mood. And I'm interested to see if it helps her with her weight. Just an experiment. But she needs it replaced. I'm not doing it for fun and experimenting. But, but it will be interesting to see what changes for her as her vitamin D comes up. And she 